2017 has been a crazy year, almost like a throw ride. In the real world we've had many wars, hurricanes, and a man who had my head tilting for many months, with the exception of lowering taxes on small businesses and reviving Merry Christmas. Then we got TV hosting Julia and the new DuckTales, God bless this show. The movie industry seeing amazing titles only to get pummeled by movies about emojis and babies that are bosses only to rise again with films about a scary clown and Pixar dominating the animation scenario with a movie about skeletons. The movie industry is hurting my brain right now. Then there's the gaming industry. Aside from one major company making a greedy way around the industry, dragging Star Wars with them, this year has gone nowhere but up. Even the largest drops, again, minus one company, was only a small bump compared to the massive uphill success. We were gifted an amazing new console this year that skyrocketed Nintendo back into the spotlight on top of a plethora of amazing titles. This was the jackpot year, baby! It's such a shame to see this year zip by with so many to gush over, but we can give one last hurrah. And what better way to celebrate than counting down my top 10 from this year? Perhaps some cake with that, but that's only available in a paid loot box. Thanks EA! However, before I jump into the games that brought the fun to my table, let me bring up a few games that deserve the honorable mention. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Pokémon Tournament DX. To put it briefly, yes these are Wii U games given the DX Tournament tossed in with some new content, but the fact that they've been put onto the Switch breathes new life to them. And when you think about it, it's a really smart move to bring two well-known titles from a poorly sold console onto its successful sibling. Bad Dream Coma. I'm gonna be honest, as a horror game, it has very few surprises. As an adventure, however, it has a ton of fascinating elements to explore. The visuals give it a horror novel look, and it fits the gameplay very well. Poyo Poyo Tetris. While I only ever played the demo dozens of times and still have yet to pick up the full game, I can say the efforts put into combining two well-known puzzle games into one is nothing to hide. I can tell they put a lot of thought and love into both, and they did a fantastic job making them work to make it something to remember. ARMS Though it grew tiring after a while, the times I spent playing this were pretty good. It's an interesting approach to bring motion controls into a competitive fighting game, though it's nice to have an option to turn them off as well. Just competing in the ARMS tourney at E3 this year got me hyped, and I have no regrets, though I ended up losing the first round of the actual tournament. I have yet to play with the new updates and characters, but I look forward to the day that I do. Animal Crossing Pocket Camp It's funny, I actually expected a mobile Animal Crossing game, but I never thought that this would be the final product. It makes sense to do something like this though, and it works very well. It still has that AC polish while offering something new to the series. Well, not that the honorable mentions had their time, let the final hurrahs of hurrahs begin. Earlier this year, the world was gifted a new console that gave a new breath of life to Nintendo, but also one that didn't have the biggest start. What it did have, however, was a new twist to an old classic series that had received numerous amount of praise, boosted the console and gained to high sales before all other Switch games got released, and even won Game of the Year. Man, Zelda has come a long way since then. When I experienced Breath of the Wild, I was blown away by the style that they chose and how fluent the controls were. Being able to explore all of Hyrule freely and at my leisure was a fantasy turn into a realistic and worthy journey. And to add to the thrill, the voice acting is truly phenomenal. However, despite my numerous praises of this game's glory and innovative twist to a legendary franchise, it's low on this list because... I haven't played much of it after its release. I know, this is a burden I unfortunately carry, and I truly wish I could go back and experience it again. And while I could, so many other games distract me. We all know that feeling, right? On the plus side, I did meet the voice actor at Zelda in E3. That's a plus, right? 
but this game is simply too good to pass. Its story, its characters, its emotions and majesty deserve more than to be looked at. They need to be played. And I swear, on the CDI King's Grave, I will return to this masterpiece because it's been at its castle for too long. Right after I look at this picture again. Oh. Oh, that's good. If 2017 has taught us anything, it's that innovation can come from two strange combinations, especially if those strange ones sound impossible together in one video game. Picture, if you will, the most well-known Nintendo characters of all time combined with the most irritating characters in gaming history that somehow reign supreme over Rayman. Put them in the game heavily around RPG, and you have one of the craziest and insane ideas that surprisingly works. Mario and Rabbit's Kingdom Battle was, and still is, the peak of unimaginable combos, but the game was done in the right hands with a neat idea for a story, sprinkled with humor that thankfully wasn't annoying or hideously common, like most things with rabbits. Praise Arceus for that. And with the turn-based mechanics, and guns on Mario and friends, something Nintendo would have never nodded on beforehand, it's made a truly fun and wacky experience I don't think any of us will ever forget, for as long as Generation Z still survives another hundred years or so. You see this man? He deserved that standing ovation, and tears of joy. He's done the impossible. And sure, this may be a good inspiration for other crossovers, this may be the one and only time this combo ever passes. If there's ever a crossover between the Muppets and the Minions, oh, that's the day the world goes into chaos and they can be just as bad as those monstrous for children videos. Do people still talk about that? While I had a blast playing Pokemon Sun and Moon when it came out last year, I've fallen behind after the story was done. It seems I wasn't the only one though, as Pokemon themselves seemed to cool down as well with re-releases of older games and third generation on Pokemon Go. Holy cow, that's a big update. They did have announcements about the sequels to Sun and Moon, but very few caught my attention. That is until much later. That's when I was determined to pick up Ultra Sun and Moon and give them a whirl. The result was exactly the same story, just with minor changes and a different ending. It's as if they were alternative versions of the first games. You know, the ones they've done before with other generations? Come on now, it's a mashup of Pokemon Platinum's plot and Pokedex, and Black and White 2's fusions. Why does this sandwich so well, yet so many people think the flavor is just decent? It's not way from Subway, that's for sure. While I will agree that the story is lackluster in terms of changes, the difficulty definitely has spiked. It was pretty challenging in Sun and Moon, but this beats it 20-fold. Yes, I may have made up a word to describe its difficulty, but who cares? On top of that, the post-game is huge! All the team bosses from the past versions is mind-blowing! And the fact that you can catch all of the legendary Pokémon and Ultra Beasts via Ultra Wormhole? Did the person who came up with this idea get a raise? Cause that person freaking deserves one at this point. I'm gonna get me my Mewtwo in VGC Landris. Oh, <laughs> 2018 battles are gonna be so fun. And the Ganadel? Oh, how I love these so. The suit at Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon wear may not be so strong, but it definitely carries a lot of style and pockets. No DLC in those pockets, but did it need that comparison to begin with? Alongside new franchises and new twists on familiar faces, 2017 also granted the gaming world a little bit of nostalgia. Okay, I gave everyone a little bit of nostalgia. I gotta bring up DuckTales again, but can you really blame me though? It's so good! In the turn of the nostalgic side, four of them happen to be shining examples. Of course, I want to give them the attention they truly deserve, but it was hard to decide just one out of these four. They're too damn good to pass up! Or you could see it as me being too lazy to pick one. Whichever floats your boat, I won't judge. The more I think about it, it's two forms of nostalgia combined into one list. 
There's the series that I've personally played years ago but haven't picked up much since with Sonic Mania and the Kingdom Hearts re-releases, and then there's the series I have never played the original games of the series or series at all with Dot Hack and Crash Insane Trilogy. This is what I get for being an N64 kid and going to my friend's house for playing Spyro and that Monsters Incorporated game. And let me tell you, it was decent. The downside of having 4 and 1 is that I can't say too much about each game, otherwise we're looking at a list that's just as long as The Lion King, so I'll use 4 words to describe each. My Disney Fantasy Reborn. Sonic's better with indies. This is surprisingly good. Should have been my childhood. In spite of these short sentences that an intelligent preschooler in the wheelchair has no problems writing down, these definitely offered a nice thrill of the past both new to me and reborn in my soul. More of this, please. Every year, there always seems to be an indie game that takes its genre or era of gaming to the next step. Who could forget when Shovel Knight made 8-bit more epic than it already was? Or how about Five Nights at Freddy's and its ways of turning something robotic again seemingly harmless? into a horror phenomenon that terrified the hearts of adults and children. Before there was kids merchandise of this game, that is. So what new and crazy ideas did 2017 indie games bring to stand out from the norm? Surprisingly, a ton of ideas spawned from the world of indies, but one went over and beyond once again in the horror genre, and it made the internet paralyzed in shock at one point. And it's free to play. At first glance, Doki Doki Literature Club looks and feels like any typical romance simulator. Well, minus the skin and the Drake and Josh's, let's be real here, but there's way more connections and feelings towards each character. Or that could just be me. Seriously, I felt so connected towards these characters, especially Yuri and Sayori. Both of them truly shine in terms of personality. But all that changes when Sayori hangs herself and left dangling. I learned that the hard way. She wasn't standing there hanging. The game then turns into a frightening glitch fest that makes Five Nights at Freddy's look like a game meant to scare only unaware toddlers. The craziest thing? This game modifies and deletes documents and files within the game's folders. That's some advancement in horror game, and that's the beauty of it. Taking a genre that usually has odd or explicit results and transforming it into one such scary thing is amazing, but going beyond the limits of the game screen is incredible. And the chills and fears you get being more mental than physical is also pure genius. This game alone, and Monica, have people talking and having a different look at gaming in its entirety. I would say more about this game, but I've already had my say in another video. If you would like to watch that, check the right corner here. Otherwise, download the game and enjoy the graphics and the chills. Or watch the thousands upon thousands of videos. You spoiling tweezer, you! Nintendo made a huge success in 2017 with the Switch and some of their older franchises getting multiple titles. Mario getting two new games, one being a major improvement over the Wii U version, and Pokemon getting the same amount and some big updates to the relevant mobile hit. Who remembers those days? Surprisingly enough, Zelda and Animal Crossing only got one new game respectively, one mobile and one getting large success. But the bigger surprise was that 2017 was also a big year for Fire Emblem with three games instead of their typical one. You probably know where this is going, don't you? To sum up how huge of a deal this is, we got a remake of the second Fire Emblem game in the way of Fire Emblem Echoes, another Nintendo version of Dynasty Warriors that personally works better with the Fire Emblem characters, and a mobile game that combines and celebrates the past and present of the entire franchise while sucking the money away from your wallet for a rare chance of a seasonal version of waifu material. Nintendo, you greedy but clever son of a gun! Separately, these get their own words. For Echoes, it's a nice way to introduce the modern fans to a game of its past, while being perhaps a bit too harsh and difficult in my eyes. Maybe I'm not playing it right? Warriors is just as good and wowing as Hyrule Warriors, though I personally feel that the format works better for this franchise 
as it is more character heavy out of the two franchises. And as for Heroes, this game may or may not have given me some money issues in the past. And while it's been settled once and for all, those summons still get to me mentally. Someday you will be mine! Just you will oh, a three star. Yippee. Still love this game though. Love the series or dislike it to your heart's content. But you must admit, Fire Emblem had an impressively successful year in terms of the number of games. May the swords be raised high for their accomplishments. Also, did you get how many times I said the franchise's name? I hope we weren't taking any shots. I'm not responsible for any hospital bills. Spring and summer were the times that the Nintendo Switch got a boost in games, ranging from Mario Kart 8 Deluxe to ARMS to Dragon Ball and everything else in between. I have mentioned the Nintendo Switch perhaps too many times throughout this video, when it came to one of Nintendo's newest IPs, they decided to make a risky move. They didn't re-release the original Splatoon with controls designed specifically for the Nintendo Switch. Oh, 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 not even close. Instead, they made a sequel, seeing as the series was a big hit. The result from this move was astoundingly incredible. A sequel that improved greatly from its first, and it fit right at home on the new console. On the surface, Splatoon 2 doesn't seem that much different, but don't judge a book by its cover. The single-player mode, while it may look like it suffers the same plot effect as Home Alone 2, is tons more enjoyable and improved compared to the first, providing more weapons to use in each level. Plus, the boss fights are insanely unique and amazing in their own right. And Marie as your mentor? Oh yes please! Seven Run is a nice addition, as it revolves around cooperation in order to survive and collect eggs for very, very useful rewards. And although it gets tough, it's like an old saying goes, what kills you makes you even stronger than they themselves. Or something like that, right? And then there's the staple to the franchise, and this has the most improvements. The specials are mostly brand new, and it feels so good to use something powerful but balanced. In fact, this whole mode feels and acts way more balanced than it did in Splatoon, and with new maps, added modes, and weapons, you can bet my inkling tentacles this won't be getting old anytime soon. Just try not to think too hard about what I just said there. Overall, Splatoon 2 is an enjoyable thrill and a sequel worthy of its own throne and set of singers and Splatfests. Now, if only Marina could win more than one Splatfest for as long as Splatfests keep the party going. I'm tired of seeing the better out of the two lose to a squid that gets spoiled with the better options and teams. It must be tough being Nocturian with moves and vocals. Ah, the 1930s. A time of the Great Depression. The era that hit America right in the guts to the point of it bleeding its hard-earned cash, crumbling the government into scraps. But it was also a time of great animation achievements, with cartoons so well-crafted and mind-blowingly violent that modern TV companies for kids would look at this and stamp the parental advisory logo on the screen when it first showed up. I mean, there were young ducklets forced to smoke cigars for Pete's sake. But then again, this also gave us the first animated movie to ever exist. The reason I even bring up the cartoons of this era to begin with can be described with just one game title. Cuphead. From the perspective of the gamer, this game nails the looks and sounds of the era to near perfection. And it's made even more impressive by the fact that almost all the sprites were hand-drawn. Coloring those suckers by hand would have been a patience disaster for us gamers. It also isn't afraid to throw in a couple of nods to other games as well as names, cartoons, and styles of the 1930s. The details go as far as yellow gloves for Cuphead and his pal Buckman in some segments, and it even references some vile stuff in those good old 30s cartoons. That's worth a lot of points in my eyes. And this is also a nice drawback to older games, back when they weren't so modern and holding your hand through half of your journey. The gameplay is a platforming shoot-em-up, which I feel they did very well in a creative way. The downside it has a lot of people screaming and throwing controllers as if they were Donald Duck in his common tantrum days. You know, before the clubhouse. 
It may seem that difficult, but I personally don't think it is. Now don't get me wrong, it is challenging, but not in the way most people find it. When I play Cuphead, I don't easily get frustrated at every attempt at the levels, obstacles, or bosses. I see each attempt as a learning curve, and an encouragement to try harder than I ever did before. Eventually, the bosses and levels are beaten, and they feel more worth the tries because of that thought in my mind. I'm fully aware that this may just be my two cents on the game. Not everyone will agree with my perspective, and that's totally fine. What I will say that everyone can agree on is that this game was well worth the wait. When it comes to the bang that the year started out with, the first thing that comes to mind for most people would be the Nintendo Switch in Breath of the Wild or Horizon Zero Dawn. Both are good titles to start off the year, but I feel that 2017 had its starting bang earlier than that. It's a phenomenal title starting the legendary digital pop idol Japan, and the one that will probably fill some parts of the comments section spamming the word weeb a lot. Oh, the maturity of the internet sometimes. I'm just gonna come out and say this. Hatsune Miku Project Diva Future Tone has been a definite start for 2017, and a success for Sega after the mediocre Project Diva X and lack of any good Sonic games until Mania's release. And if you think I'm over-exaggerating because my inner Vocaloid fan shows no mercy, may I remind you of the score this game received on Metacritic. Yeah, the critics don't lie here. It's also a blast to play constantly, and I enjoy spending time playing and improving on my Project Diva skills as time goes on. And no, I'm not just saying this because of Minute 39, although that series is a particular factor to this. This game has a huge category of songs, from all of the diva games combined, and it's made even bigger when DLC is thrown into the mix. And this is an EA type of DLC, where it's mostly forced. This is Smash Brothers level of DLC. Every extra content feels so good to have, and it makes the replay value even bigger. It's already big enough. Sadly, the photo studio doesn't live up to par though. Needs more stickers. Like I mentioned with the Doki Toki Literature Club entry, I've already reviewed Future Tone as a whole on another video, as part of Miku Month. You can check out the review of this that goes into more detail on the right corner. Alongside the many songs and tricky but fun new mechanic, it also gave me a chance to live out a dream of mine. For years, I wanted to play the arcade game when I first heard of it. And to have it released here in the West is amazing. Just comes to show how passionate the vocal community is for their games. Future Tone was an amazing way to start Miku's 10th anniversary and 2017, and it definitely will be cherished and played for years to come. Happy birthday, Miku, and I hope you had the best one. So, how many weep comments does this get? Where do I even begin? How do I tackle a game this phenomenal and awe-inspiring? There's just so many things to praise with this title. After all the same 2D shenanigans Mario had to go through because it made sense, and by sense I mean money, people had enough of the same mechanics. And when people had enough, Nintendo had to resort to something most true Mario fans and hardcore Nintendo fans would appreciate. 3D platformers like Mario 64 Galaxy and Sunshine. But this isn't some copy and paste project we're talking about here. This goes far, far beyond that. Super Mario Odyssey is a glorious step to get Mario back into the collection platforms, but that statement alone isn't enough to fully state how fantastic this game is. Nintendo took what made games like Mario 64 such amazing games for the Mario series and greatly improved these mechanics. How the freak did they manage to do that? That almost sounds impossible, even for Nintendo, but they managed to build upon it and make it look easy to do. There are a huge number of collectibles together, and the total is gigantic compared to the others. Like, really gigantic. Every world in this game is a sight to behold, and I have spent hours in each world to collect everything and observe every crook and nanny of the area, which Nintendo encourages. Even my least favorite world has amazing details to look at. Oh, and there's huge nods to Mario's other titles, both well-known and forgotten. 
and I should mention that Cappy is an amazing idea for a power-up. This allows them to take control of enemies and objects like Goombas, Bullet Bells, and a freaking Tyrannosaurus Rex. The possibilities here are truly infinite, and it is absolutely mind-blowing. All of this is tied to a clever twist on a pretty common story theme from the Mario series. Sure, the wedding thing has been seen before, but this expands that idea and possibly does it even better. The Nintendo Switch and Breath of the Wild was a great acceptance letter, and Super Mario Odyssey was the best thank you letter to the fans everywhere. Without any doubt, this is extremely innovative, and it deserves all the praise it gets. And it goes without saying, Super Mario Odyssey is my number one game of 2017. My hat is off to you, Nintendo. You truly deserve it. 2017 has been one of the greatest years for gaming, no doubt about it. Every gamer this year would be proud to call themselves a gamer, and they rightfully should. A ton of great games came out, all of them with the joy and spirit of gaming and infinite amount of replayability throughout the upcoming years. 2018 has a really tough act to follow but I have no doubt it'll pull through. From the looks of it, they have some promising games up ahead, and I can't wait to dive into the new year and give them a whirl. But of course, 2017 will remain a treasure in my heart. Well, what are your best games in 2017? Leave your list in the comments. I love reading your list and opinions, so there's no need to be afraid to let your voice be heard. And as always, thanks for watching. I hope you're looking forward to 2018 as much as I am.